Uh, you have a very long and distinguished uh, career as a, as a physician. So can you give us some, uh, an idea of the experience that you have working specifically with people with diabetes? Well, actually, it's unusual where I find myself these days because, quite frankly, when I uh, finished my uh, residency, in, uh, it was in general surgery. And after I had uh, <clears throat> a year at Fort Bragg in the Army, my next year was in Vietnam as a combat surgeon. And when I got back from Vietnam, I was asked to join the staff in the Department of General Surgery at a place called the Cleveland Clinic. And I was there as a surgeon for 31 years. And my primary responsibilities were largely as head of the section on thyroid and parathyroid surgery and the chairman of the breast cancer task force. Uh, but it was probably halfway through my career, about 1980, 81, 82, I began to get increasingly disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, <clears throat> I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And this led me to a bit of global research, and it was really quite striking that if you could see that there were other cultures where breast cancer was 30 or 40 times less frequent <clears throat> than in the United States, like, for example, uh, uh, in uh, Kenya and my gracious uh, in rural Japan in the 1950s breast cancer was very infrequently identified and yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States for the second and third generation they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart and even perhaps more compelling was cancer of the prostate in the entire nation of Japan in 1958, how many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? The entire nation, 18. Now that was one of the more mind boggling public health figures I'd ever seen. By 1978, they were up to 137, which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who will die of prostate cancer this year in this country. Well, somewhere along the line of, with this, I began to get increasingly, uh, uh, Doubt, doubtful that uh, my bones would long be dust before I might get the answers between nutrition and cancer. Although in hindsight, I'm not sure that's not correct. But nevertheless, I decided at this point to look at the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, which was cardiovascular disease. And in many of these cultures uh, that we were looking at globally, uh, cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And the common denominator was they were all thriving on whole food plant-based nutrition. So it was really rather exciting to think that maybe if we could get people to eat to save themselves from the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, heart disease, if they were eating to save themselves from heart disease, they could probably save themselves greatly from the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and uh, pancreatic perhaps. So that was sort of the background. And, uh, and I started a, a small study in 1985 uh, of patients severely ill with heart disease uh, who had failed their first or second bypass, they had failed their first or second angioplasty, or they were too sick for these procedures. And the uh, uh, goal was to try to see if we couldn't get them to eat plant-based nutrition and it was very exciting because not only did their symptoms begin to disappear, but we actually then and carefully measured them, began to find that they were reversing their disease. And so that was uh, really a little bit of a protracted way of <laughs> giving you how I got into this. But uh, uh, after I, yeah, I guess what that was. <laughs> after, uh, after I re retired from surgery, uh, I did, uh, the research was just too uh, exciting to relinquish. And so for the, for the last 15 years, uh, I've continued uh, to, uh, to really stay active in uh, running the uh, cardiovascular disease prevention and reversal program at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute. Okay. so. Let's talk about your landmark study. I believe it started in 1985, and 
what did this study show and why is it so profound? Well, I think what was exciting about it was that uh, we had <clears throat> uh, an opportunity to, I think, to prove two things. One, that patients would follow this diet, and two, that it would be a, a effective. And both of those came true. Now, the, the rock upon which this study was most likely to flounder was lack of patient compliance. And I was, uh, uh, I was a really a bit of a neophyte. I didn't, had no psychological training. But uh, I decided that the, the mantra that I would use for these patients would actually be the same mantra that I had been using for my cancer patients that I had learned years ago from a marvelous uh, caring surgeon from the West Coast by the name of Bert Dunphy. And Bert used to say that patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer. Patients with cancer are not afraid to die. But patients with cancer are afraid of being abandoned by their physician or by their family. So when I started this program, I wanted to see each of these patients every two weeks in my office. So I could go over every morsel they ate, check their cholesterol, blood pressure, and weight. And uh, it really uh, was very exciting. And I, of the original 24, uh, there were six within the first, really the first month and a half. I had no money for this study. So I released them back full time to their expert cardiologist and they became sort of my quasi control group, if you were. But those 18 that stuck with us uh, was really quite exciting to see. Not only is it they're losing weight, their symptoms are disappearing, their blood pressure was normalizing and their cholesterol was plummeting. And it was very exciting when we carefully measured them. We did angiograms on 12 of those 18. And the four of the, uh, those had dramatic uh, angiographic reversal of, of the disease. And, these, and their, ang their angina was disappearing. It was really quite profound what was, what was happening. Uh, so we wrote this up in the uh, peer-reviewed scientific literature a number of times. And it was very, very hard to for the cardiovascular community to accept this. Although must, I must say about the same time, actually even uh, several years before us, Dean Arnish had done this, the same thing on the West Coast, although we didn't know each other until we were each several years in, into our study. But uh, the thing that made it <clears throat> uh, challenging was the fact that the cardiovascular community felt that this was such a rather significant and profound nutritional change uh, that uh, how were they sure that we could, this could ever be repeated? And that's what we were so excited about in July of, of 2014 in the Journal of Family Practice. This time we repeated it again with uh, over 198 patients. And of those close to 200, we lost two to follow, which is why it's 198. Uh, of those <clears throat> original uh, patients, the 198, there were 89.3, almost 90% who were adherent to this type of lifestyle change, which is a, a very significant change for these people. And of those who made this significant change, over the next close to four years of follow-up, they had one patient who had a major cardiovascular event. He had a stroke, well, a mild stroke while he was in China from which he recovered, but he was <laughs> While he was in uh, China, he was misbehaving. Uh, so I guess you might even say that he was not in that group. But uh, anyway, so 99.4% over the next close to four years had no further major events. On the other hand, those 21 who were not adherent had 62% had uh, recurrent cardiac events. So it was, it was very, very clearly demarcated how, how powerful it can be because it wasn't a pill, it wasn't a procedure, it wasn't an operation. It was a lifestyle change, and really what it was, was making these patients aware of the power of nutritional literacy to be able to change their lives. Because what happens to these patients, they lose weight, they lose their hypertension, and if they're, di and if they're diabetic, you've really got to be on your toes because on their morning glucose measurement, it starts to drop. And then that means they're going to have to start cutting back on their diabetic medications as well. 
and if they were, had high cholesterol, that's coming down as well. So it's, it's really very exciting how something is as straightforward and safe and enduring and powerful as food. I mean, compared to the Pharmageddon that people are getting these days out of the pharmaceutical houses, just think how exciting it is to cure them with food, with food that is delicious. Now, the challenge here, I mean, my, is how do you get these people to adhere? How do you get these people to comply? That's the, that's the challenge. And <clears throat> we've changed that a little bit. And that see, with the present group, about 85% of these patients were from outside of Cleveland. They couldn't, so I couldn't see them regularly. So we had to do this in one exposure. One five and a half hour intensive seminar is what we've been doing. And what we found during this seminar is that these patients are gonna learn all about how they have created their disease and how they can become empowered as the locus of control to halt and reverse their disease. And everybody in addition gets a very hefty notebook. And in that notebook is a copy of every PowerPoint that I use during the seminar, several of our scientific articles, a 44 page handout with many additional uh, recipes that add to the 240 in the two books that we provide. There's a marvelous uh, hour and a quarter presentation from Anne, <clears throat> who's had 30 years experience acquiring and preparing plant-based foods, dealing with reading and ingredients, travel and restaurants. And then everybody receives a DVD of the entire seminar that I filmed from an earlier one. So should they go home and get forgetful or rusty, they can flip this on and get themselves back up to speed. Then we always have a presentation from three local or regional participants who've had a previous successful experience, share their story with those in attendance who can then say to themselves, listen, if he or she can do this, I can do this. Then we have a delightful uh, plant-based luncheon and an opportunity to answer everybody's questions and then stay in touch as necessary through email or phone call. And I think that the reason we have this success rate of close to 90% is that we show the patient respect. How do you show a patient respect? You show the patient respect by giving them your time. Very few physicians were gonna give patients five and a half hours. And I should add, I usually call all these patients 10 days before they come. Why? Because in that phone call 10 days before the seminar, it gives me an opportunity to get my arms around their story and at the same time provide them an opportunity to ask questions of me so that when they do come to the seminar, we have a strong platform from which we can all move uh, forward. 